I think it'd be safe to assume that every single person in here has felt at one time or another that frustrating feeling that goes on when you forget something. You know, you're rushing out the door and all of a sudden you realize you don't have your wallet or you don't have your keys. Those frustrating things when you lose them. Frustration can be such a difficult thing and it happens uh, because we, we've lost something and those things typically are important. Like I said, you lose keys, you lose your wallet or 49ers fans lose their dignity every time they cheer for the 49ers, just a bad organization. Go Rams this year, it's gonna be a good year for us. Looking forward to it. But it's frustrating when you lose those certain types of things because uh, you want to have this you know, great experience of getting out of the house, getting out quickly and you're going someplace and you have a specific way that you're trying to get there and you don't wanna be held up by this. You understand the frustration that goes on with forgetting something. But frustration and fear are two different things. Have you ever been in a situation where you've forgotten something and it caused you to be in fear. It might happen for a parent if they've lost a child. You just all of a sudden you think, Where, you know, where's my kid in the sea of people? Fear would start to grip you if you lost that because of the importance of it. I was reminded of that as I saw a story this week about a woman and the title of the story was <clears throat> The Woman Who Gets Lost Every Single Day. It's a detail of a woman who has a disease called developmental topographical disorientation. And she regularly forgets places that she's visited every day of her life. She could be in a room in her house and all of a sudden be disoriented and not realize where she is. So she first noticed it as a, as a kid. She ran into the backyard, saw her mom and said, Mom, where are we? And the mom's like, we're in the backyard, sweetie. You've been here for seven years of your life. How do you not know where we are? It's just incredible to watch the daily struggles that she has as this, this could pop up at any point in time. She says even like getting close to bodies of water sets it off completely and just disorients her and she doesn't know where she is. That can be a very fearful thing. You know how she survives it? She survives on repetition. As you watch this video, you see this woman drive down the streets of her neighborhood and she's saying this, you're going straight, you're going straight, you're going straight. Turn to the right, stay to the right, stay to the right. Don't look left, don't look left, don't look left. And she has to constantly repeat this to herself to make sure she's never disoriented in where she's trying to go. I think there's a great metaphor in that for the Christian life. You know, over and over again, the Christian is told not to forget the components of the gospel. You could think of Paul in Galatians 3. You foolish Galatians, you, you were started by the Spirit of God. Do you think you're gonna continue in the flesh and that's how you're gonna get yourself saved? Or 2 Peter, such a great one. 2 Peter 1, he says something to the effect of uh, uh, those people who, who forget to grow in their Christian faith are so nearsighted that they are blind, having forgotten they were cleansed from their former sins. See, it can be a great temptation to forget what God has done for us. And the moment we do that, we're automatically disoriented to the work that God wants to do through us. I don't want that to be the testimony of our church. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to do a little series in between ending Nehemiah and starting the Gospel of Mark called Made Alive, the Transforming Power of the Gospel, where hopefully we're able to remind ourselves over and over again of the great work that God has done for us to orient us to the fact of the great work that he's calling us to do each and every day. And we're going to start in the book of 1 Corinthians. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. We're just going to do a sampling of passages over the next three weeks if you're new and visiting with us, we typically go through a whole book of the Bible. We're going to go verse by verse through the scriptures. But this, the next three weeks, we're just going to pick some, some gospel-centered texts that are going to help us focus on the work that God has done for us and what he can do through us when we have that right orientation. It's pretty cool. 1 Corinthians 15 has just been a, a refreshing thing for me this week. But if you've been with us in every day in the Word, we've, we've basically read through almost all of 1 Corinthians. I think we're somewhere in chapter 12 today. We're, we're working our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. If you don't know about it, it's a correspondence essentially between Paul and the Corinthian church, which he had great involvement with if you read the book of Acts. And it's typically Paul dealing with questions that the Corinthians had, but also things that he needs to critique or change inside the church because of sinfulness that's going on in them. And he starts the beginning, chapter one, talking about how no one can boast when they really understand the work that God has done for them. The reason he wants to start there is because some sort of pride has risen up in the Corinthian church, and that causes division among certain people. To some people say, I'm of this person. Some people say, I'm of that person. And Paul just says, is, is Christ divided? No, we're all united together because we all came the same way. That's the argument we made in upward, inward, outward. 
we come to church and God gets the most glory in the church because we all come in not boasting in ourselves but boasting in the salvation God has given to us. So he shifts from there and then he starts to talk in chapters five and six about just some heinous sins that are being tolerated in the church. He says you can't do that. If you have been saved by grace, this type of sin cannot be characteristically known of you and he deals with that sin. Then he starts to talk about some questions that they have concerning singleness and marriage. And then he gets to chapters 8 through 10 and he starts to talk about Christian liberties and what it means to use what God has made available to you in Christ and how you shouldn't use those to flaunt your freedom, but you should use those to serve others. Then he shifts to talk about communion. Then chapters 12 through 14 are about how you just serve in the body of Christ. And now in chapter 15 to where we're going to be this morning is essentially summing up the whole letter of what he would want to say and want the people to know. And if we look at verse 1 of chapter 15, I think you'll see what I mean by that. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I think you hear Paul's heart here. You know what he wants the Corinthians to remember. Chapter 2, I think he said something to the effect, I came and I, I knew nothing among you except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, as he's getting ready to end the letter, he's saying the same thing. I want to walk away and I, I just want to remind you so that you have settled in your mind the work that God has done for you. And once you have that reviewed daily, reviewed constantly in your mind, that really helps keep the orientation of what you are called to do as a Christian in the right perspective. Never going to a legalistic, I'm going to earn my salvation, or never going to, hey, it doesn't matter what I do, God's forgiving me, but keeping you oriented on the path of the Christian life that's going to be a life pleasing to God. So I think we need to take a note from the Apostle Paul here, and let's write this down number one on our outline. We need to constantly review the gospel. That's what we should constantly do as a church. It's what we're doing this morning. It's what we do whenever we come together in communion, right? Jesus said we're going to do communion and it's not that it's this you know, mystical experience, it's a symbol to remind us of the work that he did. So we need to be a church who constantly reviews the gospel. We'll talk about how to do that in a moment, but we want to talk about what we're reviewing when we do that, because that's what Paul does here. Just an utterly fascinating letter that Paul has written ends with such a, a powerful punch at what the gospel really does for you. So take a look at it. I would remind you, brothers. Very interesting word because the word remind is really from the Greek word to know. And that's been a stress of Paul the entire time. You need to know these certain realities. You need to have a fixed understanding of them. See, for the Corinthians, knowledge was something that they craved, but it was a knowledge that led them towards pride. Paul doesn't want that. Paul wants the settled knowledge that they have in the gospel to lead them to something, which we'll talk about in point two, which is that aspect of humility. Because when you fundamentally understand the gift of grace in the gospel, that's all it can really lead to. But in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, Paul says this, knowledge will puff up, but love will edify. See, the Corinthians wanted to pursue this type of knowledge that they could flaunt in front of people so that those people would flatter them in how much they knew and could talk about uh, theology and how much they could speak about the Bible. See, that type of knowledge is, is prideful. It will cause you to boast in yourself and not do the right thing. Paul wants you to have the right knowledge, and this knowledge is of what Christ has done for you. And so he summarizes it. I, I want to remind you of the gospel, brothers, that I preached to you, just a summary verb. And then he says, and that you received. And then he switches tenses, and he says, in which you stand. Very interesting word. Stand has the idea, it's found in the perfect tense, if that means anything to you. What that, all that means is that it's an event that happened in the past that has ongoing implications to the present. So this reality of this gospel that was preached to them that they received is not just a one-time thing that they leave at the beginning, but they stand in it consistently to this point in time. This is the fixed certainty of their relationship with God, what Christ has done for them in the gospel. And he says that you should be standing in this and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word, I preached to you unless you preached in vain. See, we receive the gospel by grace through faith, but there is a certain type of belief that is effective saving belief. You remember when we studied the book of James, right? There is a type of saving faith that God honors and grants the gospel to, and there's a type of faith that is just intellectual and all talk and doesn't really do anything. 
So there are people who are believing in vain because they're not holding fast to their original entrance into the kingdom of God. What that settled reality was in the work of Jesus Christ. And so he wants to say, hey, don't believe in vain. Don't think that that's just something that you need at the beginning and then it doesn't have any impact on your life right now. No, you stand in that daily. You have your relationship with God. You should be reminded of that constantly. And that's what he wants to do. So take a look at verse three. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So Paul delivered, literally gifted them. He gave them this gift of grace because it was given to him, presumably on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter nine, when the resurrected Christ appeared to Paul and told him these things. I, I'm delivering to you of first importance. Just like the foundation of a home, if you think about that. The foundation of a home has that priority, that first importance. You could have the best building material afterwards. You could have the best architects. You could have the best construction crew. And you could have all of that, and it would mean nothing if you didn't have a solid foundation. Because you would build and work, and all of it would crumble because it's not built on something solid. The priority of the foundation must be taking place, and it must be laid correctly for you to actually be able to build effectively on it. That's what this gospel is. And what is that gospel he's going to give to you? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. So it gives us just a summary of what the gospel is, and that's going to help us as we constantly review the gospel. So letter A on your outlines, whenever you're reviewing the gospel, you need to understand and review this. What was accomplished? When you're reviewing the gospel, you should review what was accomplished for you, and that's exactly what Paul's going to teach here. What was accomplished for you when Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again three days later. And as you constantly review that, that's going to give you greater um, certainty, greater stability, greater strength to stand and do what God has called you to do when you know what he's done for you. See, I love that phrase. I delivered to you of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. You heard twice as I read that description that this is based on the scriptures. This is not Paul's opinion. This is not just a vision Paul received. This is tied directly to the Old Testament. Specifically, that's the scriptures that Paul is referencing. Sounds very similar. We don't have time to go to Luke 24, but just write down Luke 24, where Jesus is talking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they're confused at why Christ died on the cross and why everything was going differently than what they had anticipated. And Jesus, walking alongside them when they didn't recognize him, said, Oh, foolish, hard, and slow to believe. All that was written in the, 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 uh, prophets and apo- uh, the prophets and the writings. That Old Testament showed you that the Messiah had to come. And yes, one day he will bring his people out and they will rule and they will be in Jerusalem. But first he has to come and he has to die. And that's found directly in the Old Testament. But you've got to review what was done for you. Look at the phrase. For Christ died according to... For Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. See, how you understand each one of those words will really show the profound gratefulness for what you have. If you don't think deeply about those words, really, that probably won't mean a lot to you. Christ, who is Christ? The Son of God. God's Son who humbled himself that we've been singing about, who was in heaven, who came down to live a perfect life for us, that Christ came. And if you love him, that should mean a lot to you. The one that I, that I worship, the one that I follow, he came down from heaven, God with us, Isaiah 9, to be with us, to die on the cross for us, Isaiah 53. That Christ is the one we're talking about. And what did he do? He died. Christ, the son of God, died. What is death? The penalty for sin. Romans 5, death came into the world through sin and death spread to all men because all have sinned. So this one, the son of God that we love, that is God in flesh, died, but he died for sins and they weren't of his own because he's the perfect spotless lamb. So he died for our sins. What do you consider sin to be? Do you think of sin very lightly? Well, then you probably think very lightly of what Jesus did on the cross. But if you know what sin is, breaking what God has called you to do, either by omission or commission, 
not doing what he's told you to do or doing what he's told you not to do. Those two different things, whatever it is, God has told you and you have broken the commandment, you've committed essentially treason and you are guilty before him. That's what a sin is and it should have associations of shame and guilt and punishment with it and that was ripped from you and put on Jesus. So do you constantly review that? If you don't, I don't think you're gonna understand what happens when the Bible charges you to do something. You're gonna miss something in there. But when you really fundamentally come to understand who died on the cross and what he died for, and that changes the ball game and that orients you. You don't forget that when you start to review it and you find a sense of joy. But you know what I love? So it's in accordance with the scripture, the powerful word of God that will never return void. Then it says this in verse six. Then he appeared to more than 500, uh, to, to Cephas, to the 12, then more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. See, here's the great thing about Christianity. I've said it before, there's an apologist. I think it was uh, Matthew, I uh, uh, can't remember, see Matthew Pate might be his name. You can Google it, but he says this phrase, Christianity is the world's most falsifiable religion. Because all other religions essentially begin like this. One person receives a vision that no one else can verify. And then they go out and promulgate that vision to other people to get them to follow it. But when you really go back to the source, okay, I, I want to see, I want to know that that's real and legitimate. No other religion can say anything, but you just got to trust us. You really got to trust that. What we're saying is not that Jesus rose from the dead and then he appeared to only the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, told him this, and then go spread that gospel. When he rose from the dead, the very people that he was with saw him. You can go talk to Peter. And you know what? If you don't trust Peter, go to the 12. If you don't trust those guys, 500 other people saw this Jesus after he rose from the dead and they're still alive right now. Go ask them. Don't take my word for it. Go talk to the people who saw the risen Christ. See, we're not banking us on some sort of mythical death of Christ. It's a historical reality. And that fact alone should give us a great certainty of our salvation. So that's letter B on your outline. Don't just review what was accomplished, dying for your sins. But two, why are you confident? Why are you confident? Jesus rose from the dead. If we only celebrate that at Easter, it's going to be very difficult for us to live the Christian life. But the reality of the resurrection is an everyday thing where we want to say, man, our salvation is certain because the one who said he was going to die, even think of John 14 to 16, he said over and over again, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again, and I'm telling you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe. We have a certainty of our salvation because of what Christ has done. Take a look at verse 12 of chapter 15. We've got to review that. Why, is it, why are we so confident of it? Watch this, verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, from, he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hoped in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. Why are we confident that we're going to go to heaven, that our sins have been forgiven? Because Jesus, Romans 1-4, was raised in power to display that he was the Son of God. A dead Savior is no Savior at all but a Savior who died and was raised and shows everything that was possible from the Old Testament gives us confidence that like him too, we will be raised one day. See, here's how this fits into 1 Corinthians 15 because we saw there are some people around them who are saying, oh yeah, guess what? Jesus, he died and rose again physically, but the rest of the Christians, guys, we're not gonna raise again physically. It's about a spiritual reality. We're not, we're not gonna be risen again physically. But Paul says those two things are intertwined. If Christ has been raised, then we too are going to be raised just like him. Take a look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits were the, the best part of the crop, but also the preview of what was to come afterwards. 
So what happens in the first fruit, you expect that to happen with the rest of the fruit that comes from it. So if Christ was raised from the dead physically and the disciples came and saw him and touched him and knew that was him, then we should expect the same thing to happen to us. So if somebody comes into the church and says, well, yeah, Christ was raised physically, but it's just a spiritual reality for us, they're talking about theology that's false. And it has great impact on the people. Now, there's a lot of great arguments that we're not going to go through that had we gone through 1 Corinthians 15, we would dive deeply into those right now, but we're going to just skip to the end of that section in verse 33 and verse 34 and talk about the implications of what this means. We have certainty that our salvation is there. We're not hoping in futility of what should be done for us. We know Christ was raised. We know we will be raised. But watch this, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. See, what he's talking about now is this group of people who've now invited their ear to those people who are dispensing this false theology. Oh yeah, you're not raised in the body, so it doesn't really matter what you do with your body. That's how 1 Corinthians 6, they could join themselves to a prostitute and think, hey, that's okay. This is just a bodily thing. It's not affecting my spirit. So that bad theology affects their good morals, the way that they live out. The only reason I bring this up and hone in on this is to show you that theology matters because the way that you think about God directly influences the conduct that you have. So you need to be very careful who you give your ear to when you start to talk theology. I take that burden very seriously because I give you theology. We talk theology here, and I hope my theology is arrested to the Bible and that when you hear it, it causes you to go out and do what the scriptures tell you to do. But there's people who will tell you things, and if they're not true and you listen to them, it's going to corrupt what you do. I think 34 is a, I think it's a metaphor, even though the Corinthians did struggle with getting drunk at the Lord's table. I mean, think about how bad it got there. But wake up from your drunken stupor, I think this is a, a spiritual reality. They're so inebriated in their, their theology that they can't live out what God is calling them to do because they're not reviewing correct theology. This is one reason just to get involved in small groups here, guys. Because we want people who believe what the Bible says encouraging one another to think that way so you can go out and live for Christ. That's what we want to do. So we, we need to review these things. We need to know what was done, why we're confident, and uh, let us see what we will become. This is amazing, what we will become. Verse 35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Maybe it was the false teacher saying this. Maybe it was the people now asking this question because, okay, what, what does this mean? He says, you foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow in the body, uh, what you sow is not the body that is to be, but the bare kernel perhaps of wheat of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. Let's jump down to verse 42. For it is with, so it is so with the resurrection from the dead. What is sown perishable, our, our flesh and bones right now, will be raised imperishable. And what is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. And what is sown in weakness is raised in power. What is sown natural is raised spiritual. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Just a quick note on that. There's constantly in the Bible this Adam-Christ parallel. Romans 5, here in 1 Corinthians 15, when we get into the Gospel of Mark, that's going to show up prominently back and forth. Where did Adam fail? Where did Christ succeed? We'll see that over and over again. Verse 46, but it's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. Listen to this. The second man is from heaven. As was, man, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of, of heaven. And listen to this beautiful phrase, verse 49. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. That's incredible. See, from Genesis 3 on, we have borne that same image as Adam. Corruptible flesh that can decay. And I don't know if you've been around death, but when you see it, you understand what happens because of sin. 
And we all bear that image. And it is appointed unto man once to die. But those who have been saved by the grace of God, who know what Christ did for them, who are confident because of his resurrection, one day we will have this imperishable body, this perfection, this righteousness, this holiness that is associated with the Son of God himself. And we will bear the image of the Christ that we love. Verse John 3, when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. That's coming to us one day. That's our hope. See, what Paul's argument was earlier, if we only hope in Christ that it's going to make this life better and there's nothing better coming, then we're foolish and we should be pitied because we should just live it up here on earth right now if this was it, but it's not. There's something greater coming. There's something that we're moving towards and we need to constantly remind ourselves, listen, this is not it. Go with me to Philippians 3 just to see a similar truth. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 Why is it important that we review these things? Philippians 3, uh, verses 18, we're going to go to chapter 4, verse 1. I love this section of scripture. Philippians 3, 18. Why is it important to review the gospel? Look at this. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, Walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. You see, Paul constantly knew people who maybe were with him at one time, and then later they left what they said they believed in. They didn't hold fast to that belief. They didn't stand firm, confident of their salvation, knowing what God had done for them, and now they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. How does that happen? Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You confident of that? I've stared death in the face. When I watched my dad die, I knew that he was confident where he was going. I've seen it. I've tested the theology against the greatest enemy and it upholds. Have you done that? Are you confident in that? Do you review it enough to know, yeah, this is what's going to happen? Look what he says, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. See, those people who are confident in this reality that God is going to do something in the future for them because of what he's done for them in the past, they stand firm in the present. Doesn't that sound like Paul in 1 Corinthians 15? That's the grace in which you stand, in which you have been saved. Guys, can I just give you two quick ways to review the gospel with yourself? Number one is prayer, okay? Do you guys understand that if you don't pray correctly, you miss out on a great opportunity to review the gospel? See, we always throw in Jesus' name at the end, which is good because we're trying to pray in Jesus' name. Once you throw that up front, like Brian Chappell said in his book, Praying Backwards, why don't you just say that up front? God, in Jesus' name I come. What does that mean? Well, I'm able to come into your presence because Jesus died for my sins, And he rose again three days later, washed me, renewed me, gave me new life, adopted me, justified me, saved me. I walk in with confidence knowing that you are not going to look at me, but you are going to treat me as if I was Christ in your presence. He is interceding for me. If you pray daily that way, you review the gospel. If you don't, if you just, is prayer all it is to you is just a list of what you want God to do for you, you're not going to review this. And you will get disoriented in what God's asking you to do. Secondly, Share your faith. What is going to help you review the gospel more than going out and preaching the gospel to somebody who needs to hear it? So if I've reviewed it and I know it and I'm thankful for it in prayer, then let's just go out and share it. And those two things can get repetitious and monotonous, but it can be effective. I want to try a little, uh, let's do a little test this morning, okay? Normally, you guys don't respond back to me, but I'm asking that you'd respond back to me right now. I'm going to say some words. And I want to see if anybody can complete the phrase. So see if you can do it. One, eight, seven, seven. Cars for kids. Okay. One, eight, seven, seven. Cars for kids. K-A-R-S. Cars for kids. One, eight, seven, seven. Cars for kids. Donate your car today. And you will remember that for the rest of the day. Okay. It will haunt you in your dreams later tonight. And you are going to be so angry with me. 
But it's going to stress the point. The monotony and repetition of that is effective. Do you know that when they started to play that on TV, donations went up 50%. People just remembered it. They can't get it out of their heads. By 2017, $39 million in contributions had been made to that company. The repetition is monotonous, but it's effective. So if I pray daily this way, I'm reviewing the gospel with me, and I'm doing what I should be doing, sharing my faith, don't you think I'm going to be more apt to, to be oriented to what God is calling me to do? But think about this, okay? We've talked about the past, and we've talked about the future. Does the gospel have implications for our life right now? I think it does. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. We skipped over some verses in the beginning section. Take a look at verse 7. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. Watch what Paul says here, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Then he appeared to, to James, then to all the apostles, then last of all, watch this, uh, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me did not prove in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, so you believed. So what Paul does now is interject himself into this discussion. But as he does that, he gives us such an amazing tutorial on what grace is. And that's point two on our outlines. We need to deepen our understanding of what grace is. We need to deepen our understanding of what grace is. If we don't have the proper understanding of the gospel, we're never going to orient ourselves to the work that God is calling us to do. And if we don't deepen our understanding of grace, I think we're going to shortchange ourselves into something that really has that transforming effect of helping us grow in Christ Jesus. We need to deepen our understanding of grace. What does it look like when someone deepens their understanding of grace? I'll just give you three things underneath. First of all, there's going to be a humility from the person. When you have a deepened understanding of what grace is, there's going to be a humility that's seen there. How do we know that? Verse 8, last of all, as to one untimely born, Christ appeared also to me. Watch this, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I think probably in your understanding of grace, you've come to the concept where you say grace is unmerited favor. And that is true to a certain extent. But I, I wonder if we changed it a little bit more and said grace is not just unmerited favor, but if we said grace is demerited favor, if that would deepen your understanding a little bit more. Because when God gives you grace, it's not just, it's not just as if you were neutral. You know, kind of like you had zero dollars in your bank account and you're just kind of neutral and then God came in and gave you money, okay? That would be nice. If I had zero dollars, I'd be like, oh man, that's a bummer. But I wouldn't be fearing creditors and I wouldn't be looking at the negative balance as anything because I'm just kind of neutral, I think that's how we just think of grace, so it's kind of a nice thing, but not a game-changing thing. What the Bible says grace is, is God's grace to people who demerit that, who've done things against him, who make themselves his enemy, who deserve his wrath. Here the Apostle Paul says, I'm unworthy of this because I persecuted the church. I was doing things against Christ. I was actively engaging and trying to stop his mission to spread his gospel so his understanding of grace is that I, I, wasn't doing, I wasn't just neutral. I was demeriting that grace. I was doing things against God. And yet God in his kindness called me to be an apostle and called me to the responsibility of doing what that is. That brings a sense of humility. When you realize that I was doing things against God, what is Ephesians 2, 1 through 3? You know, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And it's not just as if you were neutral there, which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's talking about demeriting salvation, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. I was doing things according to my passions, according to my flesh, and I was running from God. Verse 4, but God, because he's rich in mercy, according to the great love with which he loved us, he reached out, 
not just to the neutral person, but to the person demerited in it and pulled them into the kingdom of God, forgiving them completely of their sins, adopting them into the family, justifying them completely because of the work of Jesus Christ. That should bring a deep sense of humility to you. You see, this is Paul. Paul's a pretty big deal if I read the New Testament. What does he say here? Guys, I'm least of the apostles. I shouldn't even be called this. Go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Listen to what he says there. Listen to his understanding of himself and the grace that he's been given because of what he was demeriting before God. Ephesians 3, 7. It's deep in our understanding of grace for this humility. Of this gospel, Ephesians 3, 7, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. Do you hear that? Paul's gone from the category of like, hey, these are all apostles and we have the super apostles, the capital A apostles who can do the works of the apostles and then the lowercase a's, just the sent ones who are going out. And I'm there, I'm the least of those guys. Don't even consider me anything. But now he goes from there to, listen, all the saints, guys, I'm the least of these. I know what I did before. I know my heart before Christ. I didn't do anything for the salvation. This was grace given to me. But what about 1 Timothy 1? The grace given to him as the chief of sinners. See, Paul really understands the grace given to him, and that promotes a humility into him. And why do you think Paul was so effective in the kingdom of God? Because he realized the grace that was given to him. He realized nothing was it of, of his own did he bring simply to the cross, did he cling, and when he did that, God granted him with salvation and grace. But now go back to 1 Corinthians 15 because this is, guys, this is so important that you see this when you deepen your understanding of grace. It promotes humility, yes, and absolutely. But look what else it does. I'm unworthy to be called it because I persecuted the church, verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Now stop there for a second and honestly ask yourself, if you spent any period of time in a Christian evangelical church, would you expect the Apostle Paul here, who is giving us a tutorial on what grace is, that he would say this amazing phrase. He sounds like Popeye here, right? By the grace of God, I am what I am. Popeye probably stole that from the Apostle Paul. Copyright the Apostle Paul way back a long time ago. By the grace of God, I am what I am. So he's saying literally everything about me is by grace. Would you assume if you grew up in a Christian church that the very next thing he talked about would be works that he's doing? I don't think most of us would assume that because when grace is spoken of, it's almost like a hall pass. Oh, you can go do it. You've been given grace. Let's just, just rest in that grace for a moment. What does the Apostle Paul do in his tome on grace right here? By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace towards me is not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Do you think about that way with grace? See, again, this for Paul has nothing to do with earning his salvation. He knows he's been saved by grace. He just listed the facts of the gospel that are true. He's going to be raised one day because Christ was raised one day. He's going to get a resurrected body because of what Christ did. But because he knows that and he's been oriented that, he realizes the grace that was given to him is also the grace that enables him to do what God calls him to do. I don't think it could be any clearer than that. His grace towards me was not in vain. Notice that idea of vanity has shown up a lot in this chapter. Believe in vain. I, we were raised in vain. Or our faith is in vain. Grace was not in vain because it was given to me this way. So not only does the proper understanding of grace deepen your humility because you realize it's not about you, it's about what God has done. But it also causes you to strive for the work of the Lord. You're gonna always notice that. I always quote these passages together because it's important. Just write down Titus 2, 11 to 14, which tells you that the grace of God appears, it brings salvation to all people, and it trains you to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That grace is effective. It is powerful. And I love that. Did you notice that even back in verse 2, the gospel in which you stand, by which you watch this phrase, are being saved. There's this present aspect of salvation that's going on. He's not talking about past salvation, which the scripture does. He's not talking about future salvation. He's oriented in the present. 
that this salvation that God is doing, a work in you right now, and that work is by grace, and when you receive the grace of knowing what Jesus has done, knowing where you're gonna go, you should experience that grace as like, man, I'm gonna give everything to Christ. I'm gonna work wholeheartedly for him because that's what I want to do. I wanna give my life that way. You know, Paul was a, a man who constantly did that. Just write down uh, 1 Thess 2.9. It's just an amazing passage. We, we studied 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thess 2.9, Paul says, we were there working and laboring among you. You know, he was a tent maker and a preacher of the gospel. And he's just giving himself night and day in blood, sweat, and tears, and toil. And then he says, I'm working and I'm laboring while I'm preaching the gospel of grace. What a juxtaposition. He's preaching the gospel of grace, which is just believe. That grace is given to you, but that grace then enables you to do what God is calling you to do. It's an incredible thought. The other one is Colossians 1.29. For this I toil, I labor, struggling with all the energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul was about that. Now, why does he say this? I worked harder than any of them. Who is the them? There's debate on this, but I think it's pretty simple. It's just the apostles that he just mentioned. He was talking about those apostles, and he wanted to know that I don't consider myself to be worthy included in that name. But don't let my humility cause you to think that for a moment that I'm worthless to the kingdom of God. Because I take the grace given to me and I expend myself for the kingdom. Don't let my understanding of my unworthiness of this make you think that I view myself as worthless. Because that's not what real humility does. It doesn't humiliate yourself to talk about things that you're unable to do but focuses on what God can do through you if you're depending upon his grace. I think we really need to consider that as we watch this. This is God-glorifying, fruit-producing, self-sacrificial love that Paul's able to give because of the grace that's effective in him. But here's one other thing about grace, which I love. It is so desperate to give the credit back to God at the end. See, here'd be a big mistake for our church if we started as Paul did. By the grace of God, we are who we are. His grace to us us did not end in vain. And then if we said, we worked harder than any of them because we understand the grace in us is empowering us to do what God is calling us to do. If we just stopped right there, that would be a travesty because grace always points back to the one who gave it. And so now look where Paul goes. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Do you notice that phrasing right there, with me? What a great way to talk about grace. It's not in me, it's literally the soon in the Greek. With me. The grace of God is with me, presently empowering me. It's everything that I'm able to do because God has graced me with his grace. That transforming, powerful grace that causes me to be able to do what he's asked me to do. He's just desperate to give the credit to God. Remember back in uh, chapter 3? This is incredible. Paul says this, um, Uh, Neither uh, I planted and uh, Apollos watered, but God causes the growth. And he says, you know, nobody is the one who plants and nobody is the one who sows, but it's about God who causes the growth. He's not trying to say that functionally we don't matter. He's just trying to say when the fame's given, we don't want any part of it. Functionally, God works through us to go out and to carry out the good works that he's laid out beforehand, Ephesians 2.10, for the honor and glory of his name. So functionally, we do matter, but it's when the fame spreads is we don't matter at all. It's simply been because God has graced us that way. You might be saying, well, great, Pastor Elliot. Uh, Last time I checked, I'm not an apostle, okay? This is the apostle Paul here talking about the grace given, talking about the hard work he's doing. What does that have to do with me? Go to verse 58 of the chapter, which should be one that is familiar to most of you. 1 Corinthians 15 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's now to everybody. And there are so many ties in with verse 58 to verse 10. Steadfast, immovable. Think about Paul telling him to stand in the gospel at the beginning of the text. But you know that word for abounding in the work of the Lord is the same word that he used in verse 10 for his harder work. Same word we have here. We now as Christians. Paul didn't get a different type of grace than we did. Paul doesn't have a different Holy Spirit than we do. 
We're called to abound in the work that God is calling us to do. It's used in chapter, I think, 14, 12 to say, strive to excel in building up the body of Christ. So the transforming power of the gospel and all that he's done for you and will do through you has a present effect in you to empower you to do all these things. What would it look like in your life if you were really abounding in the work of the Lord? You'll do that when you understand what's been done for you, when you're taking time to evaluate that. I love that. Watch this, knowing, fixed knowledge. This is the knowledge you need, that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Look, it's desperate to give it back to God. This work is for God and in God. We don't want any of the credit ourselves. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory. I think this is a call for us to understand that when we review those facts, we understand the grace given to us, there's so much that God can do through us because we realize it's not about us, but it's about him and his ability to work in us. I told you a while back I was reading the book uh, Shoe Dog, which is about the the company uh, Nike, the founder Phil Knight. He tells a a story uh, near the end of part one of the book where it was uh, the company Blue Ribbon, which is I think how Nike started the name, uh, was about to go bankrupt. They couldn't pay their vendors. People were late in paying them, and they just found themselves in huge debt, unable to get out of it. An FBI investigation took place, and they're possibly serving prison time because they're defrauding investors and not able to make these payments. Well, they had a friend named Mr. Ito, and Mr. Ito believed in what uh, the company Blue Ribbon, one day Nike, uh, could do and would be. So in going to a meeting where they were going to get probably investigated by the FBI and sent off to prison, Mr. Ito shows up with them, and he looks across the table to the bank, and he says, "Uh, how much is the debt for this company right there? And the guy, (laughs) it looks like a movie. I I don't know if it's true. I'm taking Phil Knight's word for it. Says the guy wrote the debt on a piece of paper, slid it across the table to him, and the guy picked it up, and he goes, that's what was communicated to me. The guy pulled out a check for that exact amount, and wiped out the debt completely, okay? That ended part one of the book. We can't let our understanding of grace end there any more than we could let our understanding of the company Nike and all that it's done end right there as well. It's amazing that that debt was finished, but that's not the end of the story. There's so much more there. It's the same thing with us and the grace that's been given to us. If all we think of grace is just that that aspect of us being forgiven of our sins, and we don't deepen our understanding of the whole story, what's going to happen to us? We'll be useless, like Peter said, unfruitful, unproductive in the kingdom of God. But let's take that grace and understand it's, it's with us, as Paul said, and utilize it to do great things for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Let's go to him right now and ask that he'd empower us to do so. Father, we should come right now and acknowledge that because we lack fear of condemnation and we can come to you boldly, is simply based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. He is the head of the church. He is our representative. He did what we were unable to do. We could never work anything as we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, in your wisdom and in your full righteousness, you gave us your son who lived the life we should have lived and died the death that we were deserving to die of. But God, anyone who puts their faith and trust in him has that resurrecting uh, promise of knowing they're gonna go to heaven because you're gonna treat us as if we were your son. How does Paul say it? Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. That's what John says in 1 John. We should be amazed that we're called children of God now because of the love that we have in Jesus Christ. And may that love and that grace we've received, God, change the way, orient us so we never forget who we are and what we're here to do. May we do everything, Father, desperate to give you the honor and glory. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus.